Hi, everyone. Welcome to your next session at AI4. We're thrilled to have everyone here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. His name is Prahlad Menon. He's a professor at the University of Pittsburgh as well as Carnegie Mellon University, and he's the CEO of QuantMD. Prahlad, please go ahead and make your way to the stage. Prahlad, welcome. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes, you sound great. And you can see me also? OK, fantastic. All right. Uh, so uh, welcome, and thanks for uh, joining me for this uh, talk. Um, I um, will, uh, hopefully, you can see my screen all right. I'm going to get onto presenter mode here in a moment. Um, so the title of my talk is Algorithmic Identity. Hey, we can't see your slides. You cannot see my slides. Uh, OK, let me just try to screen my, share my screen again. OK, now you should be able to see my screen. Yes, we see your screen. And OK, there we go. Okay. Wonderful. So uh, the title of my talk is uh, Algorithmic Identification and Stratification of Stroke Risk Using Medical Images. Um, so I have a few different approaches in my research program where medical images are quantified. Um, one is using statistics-based appearance models and um, quantification of shape and structure and so on, measurements. And then the other is using function and flow, all right, um, which sometimes involves the use of physics-based simulations as well. And all of these features eventually bake into some AI for the purpose of establishing binary decision-making and so on. So uh, I will um, walk you through this whole uh, process step-by-step uh, step and hopefully give you a sense for what uh, my research program is about, right? Uh, so the gender is uh, the, uh, you know, I'll tell you who is this guy, that's me, <laughs> who I am. And then uh, after that, we will get into a brief overview of my research program, how it got to this point, and then uh, get into personalization for a stroke. Um, okay. So basically, um, Data science is kind of central to what we're doing in the lab, even though we're using computational modeling and uh, physics-based methods and so on. Really, all of that is a part of the, the universe of data science simply because um, you know it leads to quantitative features that can be utilized as your columns in your analysis later on, right? So eventually, it kind of uh, all ties together. But on a high level, we start with medical images and signal data, EHR data, EMR data, and that sort of thing. Features from these data um, in using physics, statistics-based paradigms, uh, and other novel methods, right? Um, correlate that with ground truth information that comes from the clinic, experience and outcomes data if it's a clinical trial, and then use that for the purpose of learning, right? So I'll try to take you through this journey. And uh, while a lot of our data starts kind of unstructured and, um, you know, mangled in various ways because metadata from various sources needs to be put together and coupled back with medical images and so on. We extract information from it, tabulate it, create some meaningful curated data sets, which we'll call the knowledge, right? And then we uh, extract, uh, we train, use this knowledge in order to train models that eventually can be used for the purpose of advocating um, the learned knowledge on new data, right? So that's the storyline. Uh, so brief, uh, you know, overview of what I do. So uh, I'm an engineering professor. I also run a practice, uh, QuantMD, which is focused on uh, AI and machine learning-based implementations and in the industry, uh, focusing on healthcare, retail, finance, uh, and manufacturing. But uh, off late, we've had more uh, healthcare focus. Um, had quite a decent amount of impact in these fields, um, but I also actively publish uh, in terms of my research program, which is primarily biomedical and focused on medical image signals and uh, medi uh, medical imaging and signals, right? Um, so the general high-level uh, overview of what this research program is about is to use quantitative image-based uh, techniques um, for evaluating morphology or the shape of things, function or how these shapes move and do things, and flow, that's what's happening inside these anatomies in order to facilitate uh, classification and regression tasks of various sorts, right? So the real focus is on the feature engineering rather than just uh, the kitchen sink approach of here's a table, 
do something, model this column, right? Machine learning is more of a commodity in this uh, in this uh, research program. Uh, but it's uh, not, um, you, you know, that being said, it is still a little bit of an art to kind of get a good model and so on. Uh, so we start with big data, and I'll tell you why we call it uh, big data in a moment, and then develop innovative software, and then use physics and clinical know-how in order to infuse, um, you know, convert that knowledge into uh, models that can apply to new data. And the goal is to write, derive uh, information that can, you know, decide on a timely intervention, like should I decide to provide should I decide to uh, um, deploy an intravascular uh, stent in a patient with an, um, uh, a co-optation of aorta? Or is it the right time to intervene with a coil embolization on a person with an abdominal aortic aneurysm, right? I mean, so how do you decide these things? It's typically something that is physics derived based on biomechanics and things that you would derive using software and then uh, after that, you want to bring these data into the operative field. And so there was a big part of my research program at one point, which was based on image guided surgery, where we bring that information into the operative field to actually provide real time intraoperative uh, surgical navigation. Uh, but we won't talk so much about that bit. We'll focus more on the feature engineering and how this is applied, uh, particularly to stroke risk stratification. So why do I call this big data? Well, the healthcare system creates large amounts of uh, data and the biggest of these data sets is medical images, right? So the body as a big as a source of big data, this is an infographic from I think 2015, but it's a wonderful one. Uh, it just tells you that the average healthcare system back in 2015 was uh, projected to generate 665 terabytes of medical image data every year. Now I would imagine this has scaled up a tiny bit, um, but basically these medical image data are reviewed by radiologists for five minutes or less and if they take any longer than that, they're going to get dinged because they're going to reduce their overall throughput of their department, right? So we want to be able to uh, derive the maximal value that is possible in that five minute period, while also quantifying information and you know organizing that information into uh, metadata that is uh, useful for future clinical trials or retrospective clinical studies and so on, right? So that the image data, which is very large, is now becoming attractable and useful. Right? And so image-based quantification techniques uh, and stuff that you, you know, I've been telling you about a little bit, but what you'll see more of in the, in the next few minutes uh, are, you know, are what make, uh, what will make this large resource of untapped image data, which sitting on something called picture archiving and communication systems in the hospital network, uh, accessible and meaningful in the future. And guess what? Uh, you know, most uh, IT plays are not even touching medical images today, right? So this is a huge untapped avenue opportunity there is. So you have like your CT scans and your functional scans, like your um, nuclear spec and PET scans and all that, and then what, and all of that sitting in these medical image formats, typically in DICOM image format in the in the medical in these fax systems, right? Picture archiving and communication systems. So now from this image, you can typically extract shapes from these images. For example, this is ten phases of cardiac function in a patient. Uh, who actually so, uh, has a left ventricular aneurysm. You can see this huge bulge there is actually an aneurysm uh, because of uh, weakened left ventricular uh, myocardial walls and therefore dilatation. And what's going to happen is this patient is going to have to have a surgical ventricular uh, restoration to improve their shape of that, uh, their ventricular uh, ventricle and therefore improve their function, right? But in order to make these decisions, you've got to start with the image, identify and localize the, the condition, uh, potentially visualize what parts of the heart are not moving all right, maybe using advanced visualization or um, using uh, scientific techniques that uh, classify this automatically for you, and then subsequently perform virtual surgery and then try to do the same thing in the real operating room, right? So this has all been part of what my research program has been doing. Um, so if you, in order to deliver unparalleled value from images, you need to quantify it in some meaningful way, extract shapes, extract functional information, uh, potentially even simulate things that you can't see based on physics-based assumptions of what's happening on the boundaries of the images. Okay, so uh, in, in short, to summarize, right, uh, we're taking image data, quantifying shape and appearance and the way things move and all that, come back, coming back with some intelligence and using that for the purpose of classifying uh, patients into different groups, identifying risk, uh, doing risk strat or stratifying the risk of these patients in terms of their proclivities to do certain things like die, <laughs> in one example, or uh, proclivities to do other things like um, uh, have a stroke, you know, 
or um, have a rupture of an aneurysm, et cetera, right? That's the high level goal. Uh, so it's shape, function, flow, and then we extract intelligence and do classification. Uh, in one example, we use morphology, function, and flow, right? So uh, in, in one example, here's a uh, paper from um, my group where we use 3D morphology of left ventricular anatomies uh, for the purpose of classifying um, patients who had uh, various left ventricular issues um, as opposed to normal controls, right? And here, morphology alone was quantified by making parametric representations of the shape of the left ventricle of the heart and then quantifying um, the uh, departure from the average normal reference uh, geometry for the purpose of classification, right? So this is where you just morphology. Here we use function where we re regionally characterize the motion of the uh, heart in, in various uh, points, you know, on the surface by surface tracking. And, you know, there are deep learning solutions that help you with surface tracking these, day, these days as well. But this was, um, you know, more of a, um, you know, first principles based method of tracking surfaces. And then we use this to come back with traditional representations that cardiologists are used to for the purpose of characterizing disease or establishing in, like I was mentioning earlier, a left ventricular restoration plan in terms of anatomical shape. And then we also do the really, really cool fancy, uh, fancy CFD, which is computational fluid dynamics, where we take the anatomy, reconstruct it, visualize, uh, use boundary conditions for what the inflow and outflow par paradigms might be, you know, and then model blood flow patterns that in turn will tell you about pressure gradients inside the vascular anatomies and so on that you cannot get by simple visualization of the medical images that easily, and then use that for the purpose of making clinical decision making. So this is what is uh, the method to use to create knowledge uh, that is not in existence by making physics-based assumptions, right? So we do all these things, right? And then uh, in all, in some, you know, we start with images, extract these features, come back with signatures of these images, and then classify them. But then the classification happens really after all of this mammoth effort is done, right? And this is where I uh, started my research program uh, with. I mean, I, when I was faculty at Carnegie Mellon, I was full time the electrical and computer engineering department and my research program started with you know stratifying heart disease based on wall motion and now we do a lot of other things including algorithmic identification and stratification of stroke so this was just uh, the abstract i'm not going to leave this slide on uh, it's on the program agenda but um, the goal of this particular project is really to try to uh, predicate risk of stroke amongst uh, individuals who are at risk of it uh, you know uh, it because of predisposed rhythm abnormalities like atrial fibrillation. So typically the heart contracts in a very rhythmic pattern, which is called sinus rhythm, which you can see here. And then when that rhythm is abnorm made up abnormal uh, because of certain presences of scar tissue and uh, other things, uh, that uh, will lead to um, abnormal contractility and that contractility will lead to stasis or blood just sticking around without actually moving from one chamber to the other that leads to the formation of clots. And those clots can dislodge and then go to the head, neck vessels through the aorta and then block some vessels in the head. And that's what causes stroke, right? So, um, you know, atrial fibrillation is one of the good reasons for having a rhythm abnormality that could lead to stasis and then stroke and so on. And 5.6 million people uh, by 2050 will have atrial fibrillation, will, are expected to have atrial fibrillation by 2050. And that's five times more than the, those who are prone to heart attacks, right? So the rhythm abnormalities are a big deal. Um, these are the people who end up with pacemakers, uh, resynchronization therapy, uh, intracardiac defibrillators, etc. And so, um, they're more prone to de develop the intracardiac thrombi or blood clots, and that is the origin for 91% of the stroke. Uh, and much of it, it originates in this chamber of the heart, which I'm circling with my mouse, which is called the left atrium. The left atrium has this vestigial portion, uh, which actually is called the left atrial appendage, which I'm going to call LAA in my slides. Okay, And the LAA actually is one of the most prone locations to thrombus formation or blood clot formation in the heart. Right. And we model that uh, because uh, we want to try to understand what shapes and appearances and functionality of the heart in especially the left atrial appendage might predispose one to stroke risk. So atrial fibrillation, th I mean, so diagnosis should be a surrogate to something, right? So it should be a surrogate to a cure or a treatment. So typically the therapy for once you diagnose something like this or 
would be cardioversion, ablation, or resynchronization, right? Um, and these are all based on you know techniques that will help you get your abnormal, uh, abnormal rhythm back into sinus rhythm, uh, where the heart is contracting in the in the way that uh, it was supposed to. Okay, so we want to try to reduce uh, people who have heart uh, you know um, strokes uh, by potentially doing timely anticoagulant therapy, uh, excising the left atrial appendage region, or potentially doing other things that uh, might uh, help. Right, so now. Uh, the left atrial appendage is, you know, something that looks like this, right? And in the, in the clinical literature, mind you, uh, people use words like this, chicken wing, cactus, windsock, and cauliflower. These are the words that they use to describe this anatomy. That's how, you know, primitive our understanding of this anatomy is right now, right? And it's known that certain complex shapes like this cauliflower shape are associated with a higher risk of stroke. And so if you find the shape, then, the, then people put somebody on, will put somebody on an anticoagulant therapy or recommend them for left atrial appendage occlusion or something. But, you know, that's not the only indicator of uh, an outcome, right? Um, but this is the state of the art today, right? Using medical images to visualize the appearance of the appendage, which let's say granted was not possible years ago when you just used echo, echocardiography and so on. But with CT, 3D CT and 3D MR angiography and so on, you can get these shapes out. But even this is primitive because it doesn't give you, uh, it's not a true predictor of outcomes, although it's cor correlated with the outcomes of stroke risk. So uh, with these shape variants, the chicken wing, the cactus, the windsock, and the cauliflower, uh, you know, these are the ones that are most associated with embolic events. But the, co the, the more complex the shape is, uh, the more uh, likely the risk of uh, an adverse outcome is, right? And so if we could quantify the flow inside this region, then we can work out if there's going to be a blood clot there and then use that as a metric that can train a machine learning classifier to identify stroke risk. Or if we could quantify this appearance that we are seeing, oh, this looks kind of complex, this looks kind of smooth and simple into some mathematical framework for appearance quantification, then pump that into a classifier, then we could train a classifier to identify stroke risk. Or we could just, hope for the best and put the image in, through a neural network, which is just going to be uh, learning about features of appearances that are global features of appearance, and then uh, you know potentially classify uh, stroke risk. Can we do all of these three things, right? So the research objectives of current studies are based on observation, use, find the category of stroke, and decide on methods of therapy. Our lab, we take the computational route compute appearance and internal flow characteristics, decide that, use that to decide on uh, stasis risk um, or compute flow inside the uh, atrium and then establish hemodynamic me dynamic metrics of stroke risk, right? Then we use AI to take these metrics and then classify stroke risk or just take the original image and hope for the best and then classify stroke risk based on the, the capability of the various layers of your convolutional neural networks that are learning from the images, okay? So hopefully we built up into this and now it doesn't sound as complicated as it, it, it would have if I just jumped into this right away. <laughs> so that said, can all images be used for the purpose of uh, the ML and the AI piece, right? We want to focus on this part. That's what this conference is about. So, uh, well, no, right? You need to do appropriate quality assurance on your medical images in order to make sure uh, that you uh, get good models and then uh, can you know trust your results, right? And so medical image quality assessment is typically done using the signal to noise ratio. And I'll just tell you very briefly, that is it's very simple. It's just the mean signal divided by standard deviation of the signal. It's kind of a metric uh, of noise that's used for the purpose of identifying, let's say, poor contrast as opposed to good contrast. or uh, But it doesn't really tell you about, oh, if there's a motion abnormality or the presence of a medical device or things like that. So we in the lab do some pre-processing to identify devices, noise, contrast abnormalities, and motion abnormalities, and get rid of those image data uh, before we even train models, right? And so we may land up with smaller cohorts, but guess what? Those cohorts are going to be more uh, reliable uh, because if you put garbage into a model, you'll get garbage out. And also, if you can, uh, if you provide enough wrong data to a model, it's going to learn something. And so, like I like, uh, like I like to say a lot in my classes, if you um, torture um, the data enough, it'll confess to anything, and that's what your models do. You know, at least to overfitting and all those things. So, appropriate. Um, classification of quality is important. And we do this using referenceless quality metrics that are based on this blind referenceless image qu spatial quality evaluator technique, BRISC. S strongly recommend this for anything that you're doing. Even if you're not doing medical images, you've got to work with uh, quality uh, um, assurance, uh, you know, in order to make sure that your image data is even viable for the purpose of modeling, right? 
Now let's say we got our images and they're, uh, you know, they're appropriate. These are our DICOM medical images. What we're going to do is we're going to extract that into a certain form, visualize it, identify the region of interest, you know, extract shapes from those images, reconstruct those surface geometries using unit, units and other segmentation networks, potentially even parametric methods for segmentation of the image, which is the process of extracting shapes from images. And then we model uh, flow by meshing that geometry into a volumetric mesh so that we can compute flow velocity, flow pressure, et cetera, inside these uh, points inside the geometry and then compute in turn metrics of biomechanical uh, importance for the purpose of revealing the risk of flow stasis, et cetera. So in one example, if we were to model flow inside these unique geometries, and these are actual patient-specific geometries, and we watch the flow of particles released at the pulmonary veins, these are the inlets, and this is the outlet, that's the mitral valve, uh, you'll see that the particles tend to reside inside the left atrial appendage, see? see the darker particles, the brighter particles are going towards the red are inside the left atrial appendage. They tend to go there and they stick around there, right? That's known as stasis. So using flow uh, modeling, we can really clearly see that the particles of, you know, uh, inside the flow are going to sit inside the left atrial appendage, which kind of justifies the whole point concept of uh, stasis, right? But, um, you know, basically the more complex the anatomy, the more likely the particles that get in there into that left atrial appendage geometry are not going to come out, right? And that's what we've been able to find. But even then, since computational models can be, you know, not trusted at times because they're based on numerical uh, methods for calculation, we actually 3D print these anatomies and validate the flow inside using particle image velocimetry. So this is our setup in my old lab uh, at Duquesne University where I actually had this setup and we actually 3D printed anatomies, um, you know, put particulate matter through, uh, you know, fluid, which was blood analog, uh, you know, through these anatomies and visualize the flow inside them and then quantified the particle movement inside the left atrial appendage and validated that the physics of flow, uh, which was modeled using the math or, or the computational modeling actually matched what we observed uh, using the uh, particle image velocimetry techniques. So validation is key, right? Uh, this you know uh, garbage in garbage out right if your models are bad and you don't you're not coming back with good cfd in this example you're going to get bad features for machine learning later on so we make very strong attempts to make sure that our mathematical modeling frameworks that calculate biomechanical features and appearance etc are going to be very good and accurate so once you do that and you have a validated solver then you can compare anatomies and so we came up with this novel metric called the residence time distribution and this is uh, the basis of uh, my phd student uh, Sarush Sanatkani's uh, defense uh, thesis uh, at the university of pittsburgh and basically what the goal is is to come back with this uh, systems model representation of the residence time inside the atrium and then use the tail of this distribution in order to quantify the difference between the anatomies as a single number and so now we have a single number that identifies high likelihood of stasis inside the left atrial appendage and low likelihood. And so that's all the math, you know, goes down to making a single number, right? And then once you do that, you can, we also kind of did models to compare uh, if we model the flow as pulsatile, that means jerky flow or steady flow through the atrium, uh, will that make a difference? And we found that, you know, irrespective of the flow conditions, the geometry is the key driver of this residence time index, right? And so now we have this repeatable measure for computing the residence time inside the heart. And so that's our biomechanical feature. We also have an appearance-based feature, right? And this appearance-based feature is gonna take the uh, actual appearance of the left atrial appendage in various images and try to do uh, principal component analysis on, uh, on it to identify how many principal components of the variation of intensity inside the left atrial appendage will be required to reconstruct a given shape. So what we did notice is you need more number of principal components to uh, reconstruct a complex atrial appendage shape as opposed to a simple atrial appendage shape like the chicken wing. Well, that makes sense, right? So what that means is that we need more principal components to calculate uh, the actual appearance of a complex shape, indicating that the number of principal components useful to reconstruct the complex shape may be an indication, indication of atrial appearance quant um, complexity. Right, and so we came back with an appearance complexity index based on this, right? First principles, best approach. This is not like throwing images at a model and seeing what sticks. This is a very fundamental approach. Um, and it turns out that it we have a way to compute complexity of uh, appearance using a number 
uh, which is based on principal component analysis. So now we have an appearance-based index and we have the flow-based index, and now we're ready to do some math, right? And even the indices by themselves, right, are able to distinguish pairs of shapes. So here, this is a simple t-test that uses the appearance-based index from this slide uh, to compare different shapes. And we find that if you use 10 principal components, you can distinguish between a cactus and a cauliflower shape. But if you wanted to compare a chicken wing and a cactus shape, because they're so different in complexity, you just need three principal components. But basically, uh, the number of principal components uh, that you have and the principal component weights that reconstruct an anatomy uh, would be useful features for the purpose of machine learning. So now with all of that, let's summarize what we have, right, before getting into machine learning. So we have a quality check. We remove data with devices, noise, motion, et cetera, pass those into a segmentation stack where we localize the left atrial and left atrial appendage. We extract the residence time distribution and the left atrial appearance indices, and that's our feature set. And then we also match this with our clinical information on future stroke or likelihood of dosage for coagulation therapy. And then we come back, use all that for stroke risk classification to classify stroke in the future, and then come back with a model, right? And this inference model will be used for the purpose of, um, you know, new data and so on, uh, classifying. Hey, data. Prahlad, we've got two minutes, just giving you a heads up. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. So uh, with all that said, right, I mean, we also do, uh, you know, the kitchen sink type mo uh, machine learning, right? So we take the medical image data, we emit the patients who have bad quality data and so on, and then finally just take the original image data and then assign it randomly into train set, validation test set, and then see what works without any, um, you know, intelligent feature extraction techniques. And guess what? That works out pretty well too. So here's an example with some 25 patients, right? And we have 25 patients uh, of which nine of them had stroke in a training set and we had 10 patients in a validation set with three of them who had stroke and an evaluation set outside of that which or a test set which had 10 patients of which five had stroke. And we were able to evaluate performance and we were able to just without any feature extraction also, right? Explicit feature extraction just with quality uh, controls able to create a classifier that identifies stroke versus no stroke with a fairly good degree of accuracy, right? Area under curve on the receiver operator characteristics for the final classifier was 88%, which is not bad. And so what this means is that just the image data alone with appropriate quality controls can already, with the power of the strong neural network architectures, this is a ResNet 3D that we used here, uh, create good value, but physics-based features and appearance-based features that you hand curate can even improve this further, okay? So with that said, let me stop, uh, right? Uh, if you'd like to contact me for uh, anything, here's my email address and phone number, and if you'd like to know about, uh, you know, um, anything that I do or if I can help you with your business problem, either healthcare-wise or otherwise, uh, you can connect with me on www.quant.md. I'll yeah, stop was, with that. That was great, Prahlad. Thank you. Huge round of applause for Prahlad. Even though we can't hear you right now, I know they're going crazy. Um, <laughs> thank you again, everyone, for joining. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you at your next session. Um, either there, take a one-on-one -on -one meeting with someone, or browse our virtual booths. See you all soon, and bye. Bye.